Hi everyone, Lloyd Reber here again with my next presentation of the course Statistics and Education for Mere Mortals. The purpose of this presentation is to consider the first part of that title, Statistics in Education. Now obviously such a phrase covers a lot of ground, so I want to take some time in this presentation to talk about what contexts and situations in education this course will consider. I also want to talk a little bit about other approaches that do not involve statistics, most notably qualitative methods or approaches based primarily on narrative. The fact that this course is focusing exclusively on statistics, that is quantitative methods or methods that deal with quantities or numbers, should not be construed as me criticizing or devaluing qualitative ap approaches. So I want to put some of that into the proper context here. Of all the possible roles statistics can and does serve in education, the primary purpose of this course is to consider the role of statistics in evaluation or research efforts in education, and particularly those related to the field of instructional technology, which is my area of expertise. But we'll consider the broadest examples, which really extend to many disciplines in education. Uh, the examples we'll focus on can probably simply be characterized as any intervention designed to help or support teaching and learning. Uh, so specific examples might be uh, training programs or instructional interventions, such as tutorials. But it also extends to other examples that aren't so instruction heavy, such as games and simulations. I think the idea of researching or evaluating some designed intervention is the best mental model to have in your head at this point. Okay, let's get started. Well, let's start by considering the difference between evaluation and research. I think people who are taking this course are involved in probably one or the other. Uh, those students, for example, who go through our master's program are going to be uh, very much concerned and really need to, need to develop expertise in evaluation. On the other hand, uh, myself, uh, doctoral students and other faculty here are, are involved in r research projects and statistics and other research methods are very important for their research efforts. So let's consider how they are alike and how they are different. Let's do a comparison of research and evaluation on the dimensions of process, purpose, the origin of the questions that are asked, who judges quality and importance, and really how do you determine the ultimate test of value. In terms of process, research for the most part is descriptive and evaluation is judgmental. In research, we are trying to be as objective as possible, or at least making it very clear what our biases are, and trying to lay out what we find in uh, doing the research project itself, and not trying to say more than what has gone on and what, what is it we have found. In evaluation, you really are judging the worth of something. Now, the purpose of research is generally to test theory and produce generalizable findings. Now I know a lot of my qualitative colleagues, their eyebrows are already raised at this point because this notion of generalizability is a very slippery slope. But for the most part, what you're trying to do in, in research is trying to help other people understand a phenomena or um, a particular uh, thing that you're investigating so they can make a determination if it applies to them. In evaluation, you're determining the effectiveness of a very specific program or model. The origin of the questions for research are going to be scholars in a discipline, whereas for evaluation, the key stakeholders or primary intended users will be the origin of where the questions are about what is it I should be evaluating. Who judges quality and importance? Well, for research, it is review by peers in a particular discipline. When I submit a paper for publication, my peers are going to be reviewing that, that manuscript and making a determination if it is quality research. For evaluation, it's going to be those who use the findings to take action and make decisions, people who control the purse strings or the funding or who has the authority to make those sorts of decisions. 
The ultimate test of value? Well, for research, we're contributing to knowledge. We are inquiring into the nature of things. For evaluation, the ultimate test of value is the usefulness of what it, whatever it is I am um, evaluating of whether or not it is in, uh, whether or not it is effective or how I can improve its effectiveness. It's rather interesting to think about research and evaluation and how you consider these two uh, spheres of activities. So, for example, some people might consider them to be completely separate entities. Uh, activities that are completely divorced from each other. However, uh, others see them as overlapping, having some similarities or commonalities and other um, uh, characteristics that are very, very different from each other. You could also think about evaluation as being part of research or a subset of research, but you could also consider it the other direction that research is a subset of evaluation. I think all of these have their merits. I tend to um, gravitate toward the center where I see a lot of commonalities, a lot of overlap between research and evaluation, and certainly many of the tools we're going to be using are going to be relevant and applicable to both research and evaluation. One of the big motivators for me to design this course was I felt we were not preparing our master's students to use statistics as a tool in their evaluation work. So I want to spend a little bit of time right now focusing on the context of evaluation. A very important principle of instructional design is this idea of instructional congruency. And here you see these three yellow boxes with evaluation in one of them, but you see instructional objectives and instruction uh, as the other two elements. And the idea is that these three elements need to match up. They need to be congruent. So that um, the, ins the instructional objectives, that is what you intend to be the outcomes of your instruction, need to match the actual instruction that you have designed and developed. And when you prepare evaluation materials, you have to be sure that those are indeed following the instructional objective so that if your instruction is failing in some way it is because um, the evaluation is being consistent with the objectives and it's showing you areas in which your instruction is weak. Now if your evaluation measures are not aligned with the instructional objectives uh, you may get some very false data. You may think that your instruction is doing just fine when indeed it is not meeting those instructional objectives. Again, a very important yet simple principle that is oftentimes violated. Here are some characteristics of good assessment instruments. Now, I'm talking about the context of evaluation, but quite frankly, I think these also apply quite nicely to research. The first is validity. Does the assessment instrument actually assess what it's supposed to assess? Is it a valid instrument? And that's the idea of that um, alignment or congruency between the evaluation and the instructional objectives. Second is the instrument reliable. That is, um, does it give me consistent results? Another way of thinking about it is the people who really know the material, and we could say maybe that the, uh, the instruction that we delivered was help, really helping those individuals to understand or know the material. Those people, when I test them or assess them, they do well on this instrument. And those people who don't know the material or don't um, get it, don't actually uh, know what they're supposed to know, don't do well on this assessment instrument. And we have some consistency. If I were to repeat the administration of that instrument, I would consistently get the fact that people who know the material do well. We, we, in, instead, we should not get an assessment instrument where, where sometimes, no matter what I know, I sometimes do well or sometimes I do poorly. The next characteristic is practicality. Can the instrument be implemented with relative ease? So uh, is it something that demands a lot of effort in order to construct the, the instrument and a lot of effort in order to actually implement? Does it require a lot of materials and a lot of complicated um, uh, contexts and, and situations? Or is it relatively easy to implement? And the, the last one is efficiency, how much time it takes to get those valid and reliable results. If I have an instrument that does a good job um, 
in that it's valid and reliable, but it takes two or three hours to actually implement uh, as compared to another instrument that takes only 30 minutes. Well, obviously, the, the efficient instrument would be the one I would prefer. So these are some good general characteristics of assessment instruments. As I've already mentioned, the purpose for evaluation is largely to determine the effectiveness of some training program or instructional program. And one of the most fav famous models of evaluation is Donald Kirkpatrick's levels of evaluation. And the idea, uh, according to this model, is that evaluation should always begin with level one reaction. And then, as time and budget allows, should move uh, sequentially through levels two, three, and four. And reaction would be simply, do you like this training program? Do you think you learned something? So it's much more of an introspective type of assessment instrument. Level two would be, did you actually learn something here? So you can imagine some kind of a, of a test or real assessment to say, let's see if you could do this. So if, it, if it was a, uh, uh, some mathematical training program, okay, let me give you a mathematical problem. Let's see if you can solve it. Now, level three, behavior is very important because it's one thing for someone to say that they've learned something or even to demonstrate that they've learned something but when they go back to their jobs do they actually uh, demonstrate those same behaviors that they learned in the training so sometimes there can be a very big disconnect between the training context and the actual work or performance context so that would be a different kind of assessment instrument about assessing the person's uh, behavior or performance on the job. And finally, level four would be, well, uh, especially in a corporate setting, does this training produce results that actually help the company's uh, bottom line or just maybe the, the organization's mission? Whether your purpose be research or evaluation, what you are after is useful data data that will inform you to help you to make some sort of decision. And the, the two broad categories of data are quantitative and qualitative. And as we said, quantitative, it's best to think of that root as being quantity, which then tells you, oh, it's about numbers. But there's also qualitative data, which is not about numbers. It's about uh, narrative. It's about verbal descriptions. And whereas statistics is going to be the tool to help us to acquire quantitative data, uh, the researcher, him or herself, is going to be probably the primary instrument to acquire qualitative data and to make sense out of that data. But I think it's also important to consider all data, so I'm a big advocate of mixed methods approaches that say, I'm looking for, again, all the useful data I can acquire that I can handle, that I can uh, deal with in a practical manner. So let's consider for a moment qualitative data. Now let me just say at the very beginning that obviously qualitative research is a huge area of inquiry. And I'm just going to touch on some of the highlights to give you some aspects of it in order to contrast it with what we will be considering with using statistics. First of all, qualitative researchers focus on phenomena that occur in natural settings. They are not interested in, in constructing or setting up experiments that are going to be artificial in nature. They are very interested in what is actually going on in all of its messiness. In fact, um, the second bullet there is all about the idea of studying those phenomena in all of their complexity. So it's, it's what a qualitative researcher is after is the complexity of the interactions. And as I've said, the researcher actually is an important research instrument. The researcher is observing, the researcher is taking notes, the researcher is listening to um, audio recordings and watching video recordings, reading transcripts, making transcripts. So it's, it's really up to the researcher to both collect the data, analyze the data, from the point of view of what the researcher knows and understands. And of course, it is a time-honored uh, uh, research methodology that is done in so many disciplines, again, anthropology, sociology, and, and so on, not just education. Now, whereas uh, statistics are often associated with experiments or experimental design, here are some qualitative research designs, and I would say these are among the, the most common 
case study, ethnography, ph phenomenological studies, grounded theory, and content analysis. And of these, the one I am most familiar with, and I would say many of my students tend to gravitate toward case studies. And the idea here is that you define a case, and a case could be a person, it could be a team, it could be a group working in an organization, it could be a classroom, and your goal would be to study as many cases as you can that provides um, enough information to understand what is going on in that particular setting. But in all cases, as the previous slide showed, the idea is to come into a natural setting and to understand it in terms of how that particular uh, group actually operates really in the real world. We are not trying to manipulate any of the variables. Whereas, as we will see with experimental design, we are going to do some manipulation. We are going to do some uh, controlling of variables in order to understand how much effect one variable has over um, uh, a particular, you know, like learning or some sort of behavior. That is not the goal of a qualitative researcher. A qualitative researcher, again, is interested in the messiness or the complexity. I think another very important distinction between quantitative and qualitative research is the way that you go about sampling, uh, the idea of determining who will be in the research sample. And uh, qualitative researchers, because they are going to be limited by the number of individuals that they will be able to handle because of the, just the flood of data, they will often be very purposeful in their selection of the data sources. As we will see in quantitative research, our goal normally is to have as many people uh, in the research study as possible or in the evaluation study as possible because the more data that you have for a quantitative study, the better. But that simply can't be done in a qualitative. So you have to be very purposeful in a qualitative research study. And this is where it gets kind of interesting when you consider the difference between quantitative and qualitative. So for example, here's a, looks like a nice young man, and maybe we want to understand his point of view about what is going on in, 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 his, in his company or his work environment. And we could sit down with him, and we could interview him, we could have a long talk with him. It would be very interesting. But it would just be, you know, information or data gathered from him. Now, you might say it's also important to gather information from other people in that work environment. Perhaps this woman has a very different point of view than that, than that, uh, than that gentleman had. And yet, another person as well, uh, we would have to gather data from, perhaps, because there's, there's many different interpretations here about what is going on in this particular work environment. We want to we get all of their input. But you see, there's a point... <laughs> of, of uh, uh, diminishing returns. And so I have a little photograph here, uh, I guess it's a stadium, and look at all those people. Let's say that is the, the work environment. Well, am I going to be able to interview in depth all of those individuals? So one of the things I like about mixed methods is, as I say, it's, it's really the best of both worlds. I might do some kind of a survey or some kind of an instrument that gets data from all of those people and then through quantitative means be able to make some sense of, out of all that data because it is based on numbers and I can do some manipulation with numbers while also um, going and asking a few people again in a very purposeful way who I select to help me understand perhaps what those results are, are telling me and I think this is that that wonderful uh, uh, marriage between quantitative and qualitative, although also known as mixed methods. So yes, I think we should all consider mixed methods, both quantitative and qualitative data. Why? Well, here are some reasons. Completeness. Well, you're going to get a fuller or broader picture with the data that you, uh, that you acquire. The two methods I do think are very uh, complementary to each other. They're also very helpful to when you're involved with hypothesis generation and testing in order to again look at maybe the why versus the what. Quantitative will give you a lot of the what, qualitative will give you a lot of the why. It's also not clear when you're starting a research or evaluation effort what exactly is the best approach and what are the best tools to use. And I think having both at your 
disposal really give you uh, much uh, better and, and more options. Um, triangulation is an interesting one. I'm going to come back come to that one in the next slide. Uh, and just the final one though is resolution of puzzling findings. Sometimes as you get data that is only of one form, quantitative or qualitative, in and of itself you can be puzzled. Uh, I think the best example might be some contradictions that you might see in, in survey data and it's only after you finally interview some people with different points of view do you start to unravel what otherwise would be somewhat of a mystery. I really like the concept of triangulation and it really comes out of the qualitative research tradition and I'll explain this slide in just a second but the idea is as you are trying to understand what is going on in a particular situation you have to wonder whether or not you are getting you know all of the different points of view or I should say or all the data pointing you in the right direction. So qualitative researchers have come up with this idea or I should say have borrowed the idea of triangulation. It really comes from um, navigation and if you wanted to know where a ship was on the ocean uh, you would you would use signals whether it be from radar or from some other communication devices from different points on land and the idea would be that if you were to connect those straight lines coming between the ship and at least two of those stationary points on land you can again draw the angle that actually points to to the ship now I think uh, even though qualitative researchers We'll, we'll talk about triangulation completely within the qualitative uh, tradition such as by having another researcher also be present and that researcher collecting data and, and to see if if the two researchers or even three re researchers are really saying we are seeing the same thing or again to have uh, you know multiple informants and again there's just a lot of techniques but I think qualitative data and quantitative data together is a very strong way to get at triangulation because of again that the complement they give each data source. So I really like the idea of triangulation and I think it's a reason to practice mixed methods. Well as I end this uh, presentation with uh, a nice picture of a toolbox I think my main message here is that the tools of evaluation and research are very very similar and again we're going to be focusing exclusively on statistics but I do hope that you see that a evaluators or researchers toolbox should contain a variety of of tools because we all have different needs and purposes and I think sometimes people are uh, likely to avoid a certain kind of methodology because they think perhaps that they are not well suited to that methodology and quite frankly I think a lot of people uh, gravitate toward qualitative research because they have some fear or anxiety when it comes to statistics. So I would like people to be very well informed and if you choose a qualitative approach it's not because you are afraid of statistics and I think you are in a much more um, powerful position to have a wide range of tools at your disposal. There is this old saying that if the only tool you have is a hammer then everything looks like a nail. Well you know a screwdriver is going to be a much better tool for a lot of other projects than a hammer so you're going to need a lot of different tools in your toolbox. I'm going to end with a nice quote here uh, from Carl Hostetler about what is good education research. I think this really puts uh, a lot of, of what we've been talking about into perspective and uh, it applies I think equally to evaluation. Uh, he writes, as we do our work we need to think beyond questions of how we will study students or analyze school policies. We need to think about how we can make life better for people. We need to think beyond our taken for granted ideas of well-being and what is good and make those ideas the objects of serious communal inquiry. Serving people's well-being is a great challenge but it, it is also our greatest calling. So with that I will end this presentation and I look forward to now focusing our attention on statistics in education. Okay that does it for now until next time.